If you ignore the fact it comprises billions of stars, M105 seems a pretty innocuous galaxy. But look a bit closer and there's more to the story. In this video we're going to hear from two astronomers, one of them telling us about something unexpected they found around the galaxy, and the other one's telling us about something they did expect to find, and it wasn't there. So we're at the beginning of this video project, so we have the entire Messier catalogue to choose from. So I was sitting, thinking about which one I was going to prepare, <clears throat> and I happened to put a tweet out on Twitter saying that I was stuck for which Messier object to do, and got the great reply back that I should use a random number generator to decide. So that's what I did for today's Messier object. My random number generator came up with 105. Somebody mentioned that you know M105 is the one you, you want to shoot a video of, and I was thinking I don't actually know anything about M105, but actually it turns out I do. I just don't know it by that name because most of these galaxies have various different names, uh, and this one I happen to know is NGC 3379, so it's in the new general catalogue. My first stop as a professional astronomer is to ask Ned about 105, and Ned is the NASA Extragalactic Database, which brings together data and references for almost every object that we know about outside our own galaxy. So I went to Ned, I asked what Ned knew about Messier 105, and this is the page that came up. This tells us the position of the object, its redshift, all sorts of technical details like its photometry, its brightness, and its position in lots of other different catalogues. Different people at different times have made these different catalogues, so Messier made his catalogue, so there's all the M objects, the new general catalogue was mainly put together by the Herschels. Then there's a few that got missed out of there and they got put in a thing called the index catalogue. So you find some galaxies called IC something or other. Um, so there's just a range of different catalogues. Conveniently nowadays, of course, when you just look them up on a computer database, it brings up all the names for you. This link here tells me there were 817 papers published in astronomical journals on or about Messier 105. So if we look back through these papers, you see giants of astronomy talking about this object. So you see Hubble, you see De Vaucouleur, you see Zwicky. Uh, if you go up and up through the years, somewhere along the line, you see another giant of astronomy, which is Merrifield. It turns out I wrote a paper about this galaxy, and it's actually my most cited paper. So the paper has got the most people who, who've, when they've written further papers about galaxies, have referred to this paper in it. It was published in Science, which is one of the two sort of real prestige journals for publishing scientific results in that and Nature are kind of the ones that people like to aim at. And it's been cited 261 times as of today, I just checked. Not that, not that scientists check these things too regularly. What caught my eye was a paper back in 1983 which said the discovery of a large intergalactic H1 cloud in the M96 group. This intrigued me, so I thought I'd follow it up further, and I discovered some very interesting things. The first is that M105 is not alone in space. It actually sits in a group of galaxies, uh, including M95 and M96. M105 is over here. It has a couple of neighbors sitting next door. So this is an image taken at optical wavelengths. But when you look in other wavelengths, particularly the radio, you see something that looks like this. Radio observations show a huge ring of gas rotating around this object. We call this a primordial ring of gas because it is just hydrogen. It hasn't been enriched by heavy metals recycled through the cycle of stellar birth and supernova explosions. This ring is about 650,000 light years across and the whole thing takes about, would take about 4 billion years to rotate around. What is the title there? <laughs> I have to look for myself. It's called A Dearth of Dark Matter in Ordinary Elliptical Galaxies. Most of the mass in the universe is not made of stars and all the things that we can actually see. It's some other form of matter that just sort of contributes to the mass of the universe. And so for a galaxy like the Milky Way, as well as all the stars, there's about 10 times as much of this dark matter. The only way you can figure out that it's there and how it's distributed is by looking at the motions of things, how it's affecting the pull of gravity within the galaxy. So the circles here indicate where the light is, essentially, in this galaxy. And then all the little symbols on there, the crosses and the squares, are all individual planetary nebulae. We've measured the velocities of them all, and the crosses are ones that are going away from us, and the squares are ones that are coming towards us. 
and the size of the symbol indicates how fast it's going. So big symbols means it's traveling fast, small symbols means it's traveling slowly. Systematically, the symbols tend to be biggest near the middle, smallest near the outskirts. That means that the random speeds are actually getting smaller and smaller as you go outwards. What we're expecting to find is that the random speed should stay more or less the same as you work your way outwards. And that would have been an indication that there was a dark matter halo around this galaxy. A hydrogen atom is composed of a proton and an electron. Each of those has a property we call spin. When the spin of the proton and electron are in the same direction, when they're parallel, it's in a higher energy state than when those are anti-parallel. And when you switch between one state to the other, uh, energy is emitted. In the lab, you would have to wait a million years or more to see this transition spontaneously occur in one hydrogen atom. But the fact that we can see it out here in space indicates just how much neutral hydrogen is out there. And in fact, there's enough gas in that ring to make a billion of our suns. If you look at the solar system, if you watch the planets orbiting around the sun, um, the ones furthest from the sun actually go more slowly and the one closest to the sun go fastest. And that's because all the mass of the solar system is concentrated in the center, in the sun, essentially. If you measure the speeds at which things are orbiting around the center of the Milky Way, it turns out the speed doesn't actually decrease as you work your way outwards. And what we found in this elliptical galaxy is that the speeds decrease in a way that looks much more like the solar system in some sense. And that's when we came up against this problem that actually the simplest explanation for what we actually see in this galaxy is there is no dark matter there. So we're at the stage now where this is still a puzzle. We still don't know what's going on here, but we have two plausible hypotheses. The first is that this is a primordial, untouched, old ring of pure hydrogen that is only now forming little tiny associations of stars, or it's the remnants of a giant galactic collision where two galaxies have smacked head on into one another and a, a, a ring of gas has splashed out as a result. This is something which appears almost completely round and featureless. And so that was the reason why we picked it, is it was actually one of the dullest galaxies we could find because we didn't expect to find anything bizarre about it. And so the fact that even when you pick on the dullest galaxy you can, you still find unexpected and peculiar results, I guess that's part of why science is exciting in the first place.